right. We can take our uh, stewarding life, <clears throat> one lifetime, limited resources, eternal priorities, and turn over to lesson number nine, and it's on stewarding friendship. Lesson number nine is stewarding friendship. True godly friendship is founded on a mutual walk with the Lord and can bring us great fulfillment. It uh, includes both having friends and being a friend. And so the Bible has something to say on that. So let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. And who will be some readers this morning? Who would like to read verses... 25 and 26, who will read those for us? DC will read 25 and 26, who will read 27, 28? Samu, all right, 27, 28, who will read 29 and 30? Nathan Fuchs will read 29 and 30, amen. And 31 and 32? Lucy wants to read those again. <laughs> amen, Lucy wants to read the Bible, praise the Lord. All right, here we go. Who's uh, DC, you start us off, verse 25. Amen. Amen. So thankfully God has provided us with solid guidelines on how to steward friendships and how to be friends uh, with, with folks. And so he tells us how to wisely choose our friends and perhaps more importantly, he teaches us how to be a godly, encouraging, help along the journey kind of friend. And so number one on your blanks there is steward with truth. Steward with truth. Verse 25 tells us, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. We are members one of another. Steward with truth. Pleasant personalities, common interests, similar goals, shared hobbies may provide initial attraction to an individual, but they really can't sustain a long-term relationship. Uh, only truth, deep heart-level truth can establish the solid footing necessary for long-term friendship. And uh, letter A there, vanquish lying. Vanquish lying. It says there, verse 25, wherefore putting away lying. We encounter broken trust in almost every troubled relationship. Uh, tears of a streaming wife who's just divor uh, discovered her husband is unfaithful. Here in the trembling voice of a man whose wife has left him. See in the pained eyes of a friend who's been betrayed or heaving shoulders of a teen whose parents have disappointed. I mean, all, you know, lying really uh, hurts and hurts very deeply. And to build lasting, edifying relationships, God specifically commands us uh, to be truthful in our relationships. It says there, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. One who values truth will guard against any form of deceit, be it in word, act, or attitude, or even in silence. And uh, Psalm 51, I'm sorry, Psalm 15, 1 and 2 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. And so here's a good question for us today. Can our spouse, can our friends, can they trust you implicitly? And that's something that we have to really strive on, you know, just being a trustworthy friend. And you've got to earn that. And, you know, they say that once you earn it, 
it's, it, takes, it takes time to earn it but, after it, but you can lose it just like that. And that's the truth. And God help us, you know, to go after putting away lying. Um, B, or letter A was vanquishing lying. Letter B is valuing truth. Valuing truth. But we, wanna, we want to, <laughs> this is so good, we want to mm, caveat speaking truth because we think, oh, great, if it's factual and if it's, it's got stats to back it up, then that is absolutely how to do it. But the Bible teaches that the best friend of truth is not necessarily statistics. The best friend of truth is love. Look what the Bible says there in verse uh, number uh, Mm. verse 15, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth with all kinds of statistics and facts, no, <laughs> speaking the truth in love. Mm. It's one of the severest tests of friendship to tell your friend his faults. That's truth. Uh, so to love a man that you cannot bear to see a stain upon him, so to love a man that you cannot bear to see a stain upon him, speak painful tr tr truth through loving words. That is friendship. Here, Henry Ward Beecher said that. Psalm 27, verse 6 says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Think about that. A real friend, a real friend is somebody that's going to, you know, they'll help you. I mean, say, hey, in love, not, <laughs> you know, not that, but with some true love because they love you. I mean, they sincerely have a love for you. I mean, Psalm 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. True friend is courageous enough to tell you the truth when he knows it will hurt. They may warn you that they sense a wrong spirit or caution you regarding an overextended schedule. A true friend will tell you when you have handled a situation unwisely, give you the opportunity to make things right. Although their honesty may sting initially, it saves you from the greater pain and consequence of error. I like what uh, Adrian Rogers, Adrian Rogers was a really good preacher and pastored a church in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, he was Southern Baptist, but boy, that guy was a good preacher, man of God. And he said this, it is better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. It's better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that comforts and then kills. He said, it's better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling a lie. <laughs> it's impossible to find anyone in the Bible who was a power for God who did not have enemies and was not hated. Think about that. In the Bible, it's impossible to find someone who really had God's power upon them that was not hated by somebody. It's better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with a multitude. It's better to un, uh, ultimately succeed with truth than to temporarily succeed with a lie. Adrian Rogers said that. I thought that was really good. Amen. Number two. So we're stewarding our uh, friendships. We've still got to steward with truth and steward with trust. Number two on your blanks there. Steward with trust. When we're truthful with one another... Uh, especially our friends, that builds in a vital quality and that, that makes your relationship, because you're truthful, you can then trust one another. And that's huge in friendship. True friendship is built on trust. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Now letter A, anger destroys trust. Anger destroys trust. Truth spoken in love will unite a heart. But truth spoken in anger leaves a wound that may never heal. The oft-quoted admonition is not what you say, but how you say it is particularly true when it comes to how you speak the truth. Boy, that's true. <laughs> I know those that are in supervisory positions or whatever at work, you, you know, you want to speak the truth, but... Also, if you want to be effective, I, I mean, I guess you can just 
class people. <laughs> but I don't think that's necessarily the most effective way to cultivate a friendship. And especially uh, among believers, as a Christian, um, it's not necessarily what you say, but how you say it. Ephesians 4, 26, we read that. The Bible says, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Ephesians 4, 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And so, uh, th these are... You know, what is clamor? We, we understand bitterness, wrath, uh, means anger, uh, clamor. This is uh, someone who's always complaining about something. As Brother Blue was talking about this morning, he has a friend or knew somebody. What was his name? Mr. Mike Frank. <laughs> and he was complaining constantly about anything. If he came in here today, you're like, why do you got those chairs on that side of the room? Why aren't there more over here? I mean, just never anything good. And that's... And, and the Bible says we should put that kind of stuff away from us. It's always complaining about something. That's what clamor means. Never, uh, nothing is ever right for them, but that is because something is always wrong in their spirit. And then uh, malice is um, spiteful, purposed, backstabbing, designed to malign someone's name. Full-blown, these six uh, characteristics there in verse number 31, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice. Um, are, here's the thing, they're so easy to spot in other people, but it's hard to then look at ourselves and be like, is this kind of stuff present in my life? I mean, we're, we're real good with our radar, oh, that person's this, that person's in there, this, but we need to stop and be like, let me look at me. Let me go look in the mirror and find out, do I have uh, bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and malice? Um, Benjamin Franklin said, anger is never without a reason but seldom a good one, <laughs> seldom good to be angry. The Bible ex ex exhorts us in Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25, make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Uh, these are the type of stuff that I personally try to instill in my boys. They're young and they're coming up, but when we have uh, morning devotions, we get to the 22nd of the month. I mean, this is in Proverbs 22, so they, we, we hit it every at once a month. I try to instill in them, hey, don't, when you're growing up and, you, and you're making your friends, if you find one that's an angry type of person, the Bible says very plainly, don't make a friendship with him, lest you learn his ways and get a snare uh, to, thy, to, to thy soul. James 1.20 says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of of God. If you value a friendship, remember, you'll not make it better with anger, ever. Letter B, anger invites satanic oppression, uh, not oppression, opposition. Opposition. It's interesting that it groups those two together right there in verse 26 and 27. It starts out saying, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And then it right afterwards says, Neither give place to the devil. Almost like these things are connected. If we'll live our lives in a spirit of anger, uh, you're going to give place to the devil. That's going to invite and really open doors for the devil to come in and really put a, put a wedge between uh, friendships and between relationships. Prolonged anger leads to bitterness, and bitterness literally opens our souls uh, to the Satan's influence. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby may be defiled. Bitter people think that their bitterness troubles and defiles someone else. But this verse asserts, uh, Hebrews asserts that um, when you are bitter, it doesn't hurt others. It really hurts you. It really hurts uh, us. The modern proverb says this, Bitterness hurts more the vessel in which it is stored than the vessel on which it is poured. So when I'm bitter towards someone, they've done me wrong, or I'm bitter towards my spouse, or, uh, you know, when, if that comes in, that bitterness, and we all deal with it, uh, if we allow that to stay, that's, that's going to be bad. I mean, that's just going to allow... Um, that's, that gives place to the devil. And 
we think we're showing them how bitter we are towards them, and we think maybe we're getting through to them, but we're not getting through to them. All we're doing is hurting ourselves. We're really destroying our own souls and really uh, causing our own selves problems. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11 says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Verse 11, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. When we don't forgive and when we hold uh, a spirit of bitterness toward anyone, that, I'm just telling you, that's when the devil will come in and try to drive a wedge between you and your friend, between you and your spouse, between you and your pastor, between you and your coworker, whatever friendship that you value. If there becomes a bitterness and it's harbored and you keep it in your heart and you uh, keep that bitterness there, I'm telling you, that's, uh, that gives place to the devil. I love what um, one old preacher, he said this, if you hurt my feelings, it's my fault because you can't hurt a dead man. The Bible says that we are supposed to die daily. Paul said, I die daily. Therefore, uh, Lester Roloff, he was a pastor down in the um, Texas area, had a home school for uh, troubled young ladies and stuff. But anyway, he said, if you hurt my feelings, it's my fault because you can't hurt a dead man. Therefore, he's saying, I haven't died to self. It's not your fault that I'm offended. It's my fault. Because if I'm offended, that means I haven't properly died to myself. Mm. Boy, Lee Robertson pastored a church there in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and that was one of his sayings. Die to self, young man. Die to self. Die to self. Always preaching. Die to self. Die to self. Make sure you die to self. I die daily. I die daily. I die daily. That was one of his things. Always talking about dying to yourself. And um, if you hurt my feelings, it's my fault because you're not supposed to be able to hurt a dead man. Amen. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Number three, steward. We're talking about stewarding friendships. We talked about stewarding with truth. We started, uh, talked about stewarding with trust. And number three, steward with our testimony. Steward with our testimony. Great question here that uh, the book asks. With whom exactly does God want us to have friendships? I, I admit, when I grew up, I never even considered that kind of stuff. And here I was naming the name of Christ. I never even considered who should be my friends. If they played basketball, basically, and, and we could beat other people, we became friends, you know. <laughs> if, if, he was a, if, uh, if he threw a baseball fast and, and I... Uh, caught it. I mean, we were friends. Uh, that, you know, and that's, uh, that was all friendship was in, in my mind. But, you know, great question. Does God have anything to say about who our friends should be? Our closest friends should be people, I like this, who want us and who help us and who encourage us to be better Christians. That would be our best friends. And we'll get into Two types of friends, and, and we'll explain that. But I think, um, and this is excellent, our best friends, those who we really are truthful with, those ought to be the people that are mm, encouragers who want to motivate you to go on for Christ. So where if you're thinking, I want to be a missionary to Zambia, that type of person says, you ought to go for it. They want to encourage you uh, in the things of God. And so... Um, Henry Ford said, my best friend is the one who brings out the best in me. My best friend is the one who brings out the best in me. Now, uh, that's our best friends. Now, but we live in a world, and we live on, you know, work on the base, work out in here, uh, work out in town. You're going to have relationships, and God has given opportunities all around us for us to make friends with everybody. I'm not saying, you know, well, my best friends are only the people in the church. I don't have any other friends outside of that. Well, that's wrong. God has given all kinds of opportunities for us to befriend people that are in our communities. The guy who works at the 7-Eleven, the person that we see on a daily basis when we go 
the gate guard. I mean, you know, God wants us to cultivate those friendships with the intent of leading them to Christ, with the intent of, of showing them what a Christian is supposed to be and leading them into a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, these would be relationships you purposefully invest in with the goal of leading people to Christ. They include your neighbors, business people, public servants, and others with whom the Lord has crossed your path. I mean, we all have these, right? There are people that know you and you know them. Now, they're not saved and you're friends, but that's a relationship, I believe, uh, without really any doubt God has allowed your path to cross their path, you being a believer, so that you can help bring them to Christ. Through being a friend and through being a testimony and through sharing the gospel with them, uh, with the intent, on purpose, amen, it don't just happen, I mean, it's got to be on purpose that you want to lead them to Christ. It, it would be, hey, gate guard, you're my good friend, yeah, man, all, all the time. Hey, our church is having a big thing on whatever. Love for you to come. Would you be able to come? See, not other, other people aren't going to be able to, to reach him or her, but you are because God has let you cross paths with them. Letter A there, be pure in our example. Pure in our example. So we need to understand this two types of friendships. And God does not call us to friendship with the world. We're not supposed to be best buddies with the world. That's what the Bible says there. James wrote, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. But, of course, that verse does not mean that we should not be friendly with people we don't, uh, who don't know Christ. On the contrary, Jesus himself came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10, Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, I think it's just good for us to understand there are two types of friends that we should have. Best friends would be the ones that are here the ones that are saved, the ones that are reading their Bible, the ones that want to encourage you to read your Bible, the ones that want to encourage you to be a witness, the ones that want to encourage you spiritually, those should be our good friends. The other friends, uh, other people in the world, if we are not supposed to isolate ourselves from them. We are not to be like, no, I can't talk to you. No, that's wrong. We should be friends with them, but understanding that uh, the intent is to bring them to Christ. They're not going to be like our bosom buddy, uh, and the, the truth is, um, like I just think in my own life, my best friends from high school, my best buddies, right now in our lives we are, you know, we don't have that in common anymore because I'm, uh, you know, really a pastor. <laughs> and it all started, not because I'm a pastor, but it all started when I, start, when I got right with God. And we were all living together in the same apartment in Radford, Virginia. And I was working at Home Depot, and they were finishing up their final year in college. But my life began to change, and their lives did not begin to change. And so fast forward 15 years, I'm a different person. I mean, I'm just, I'm not the same guy. But they are the same. They, they, there's no change in them. They've gotten older, they have families, but, but what the philosophy that they had 15 years ago is exactly the same. There's no growth. There's no, hey, there's no wisdom there. They're, they're, they're still like they've always been. But I'm different now. Uh, so for me to be my best, be best friends with my old high school, it's just not, it's not going to work, really, because I want to sit down and talk about Genesis. And he wants to sit down and talk about Genesis. <laughs> and it just doesn't, they don't work. I want to sit down and talk about my kids and what we're teaching our kids and boy, the wonderful devotion we had the other day about, you know, when you're getting ready to, you got to watch where you're going and, and understand uh, life and have some thought. You know, th there is nothing, I mean, what, his, he's not going to have any of that. There's got, it's just going to be like, and so part of this will happen, um, it just, life, it's not that life happens, it's that the Christian's different. But then I think about like Bo, who I've only known Bo for maybe two years now. But he's a good friend. A 
super good friend. I could sit down with Bo. I could call Bo up and I haven't talked to him for a little while. I'm like, Bo, let me share with you this verse, man. This was good. And he's like, Pastor Danny, that is excellent there. I was out the other day trying to witness to my coworkers, and, and we have a friendship that's really foundationally settled. Do you know Bo? No. Okay, he's from London, of course. A bit like, you know. <laughs> But I don't know him, but for two years, but our friendship is more solid because we can talk about the real things of God where my best buddies from high school are just, I love them, I'm their friend, but it's, uh, it's a different friendship than that I would have with like Bo. It's just different because our um, you know, interests really are different. Uh, le- uh, let her be there, persistent in edifying persistent in edifying. I like this. As we, as friends, value truth, conquer anger, choose forgiveness, as we grow in the, to the position to meet, uh, we grow into the position to meet one of the greatest needs of any person, and that is encouragement. When, we, when our friendships are based on godly things and we begin to uh, seek truth and we're getting over anger and we're ready to forgive people and we're going forward, your friend, you, become, you get into a position where you can be really a help. And that is you can be an encouragement. You can be persistent uh, in edifying. Look what it says there in verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Corrupt communication is just plain incompatible with edifying communication. Corrupt speaking and edifying speaking are on, that's North and South Pole. They're just incompatible. If we're going to make encouraging, if we're going to be encouraging in our friendships, we must make the conscious choice (laughs) to guard our tongues. This includes not only gossip and backbiting, but many uh, off-color speech. We have to, and the Bible talks about it, man. It's a, uh, we got to watch our tongue. James chapter 3 talks about it. we got to be really mindful of the things in the words that we say. Uh, minister, that says there, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Minister means to give something to someone. Uh, of your own accord, to give one something to his advantage, to give a gift. And so <laughs> we want to minister grace. Treasure of friendship comes the opportunity to be a minister of grace, one who consistently builds, edifies, and strengthens others. That's a good friend. One who consistently will build you up, edify and strengthen you uh, in the things of the Lord. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Determine, I like this, determine to give encouragement in every relationship. I mean, when we wake up in the morning, we wash our face in a bath of praise, and we start worshiping God, and then we go uh, throughout the day with this intent. I'm going to try to encourage people today. I want to be an encouragement. This isn't the power of positive thinking. This is, I'm following scripture, so it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of my mouth, but that which is good, that I may minister grace, that I might edify one another in the faith. Just go ahead and obey the scriptures and say, God helping me, Holy Spirit, I don't want to grieve you. I want to be that type of friend that wants to minister grace. I want to be that type of friend that will be an encouragement and edify and build people up. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Ward, a William Arthur Ward said, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not forget you. That's good. And let her see there on your blanks when we're done. Patient in forgiving. Patient in forgiving. When it comes to relationships, all of us are either scorekeepers or grace givers. That's good. 
were all scorekeepers or grace givers. Peter was a scorekeeper. <laughs> How many times do I got to forgive him? Well, that's one, two, how many times? He, he was trying to, hopefully Jesus was answering, okay, at this point you don't have to forgive anymore. Okay, good, then I, you know, not. Nah. And Jesus says, you keep on forgiving till seven times 70. I mean, you know, in other words, um, Jesus' command is obvious. Forget the scoreboard and make forgiveness a habit in your life. Don't, don't be counting. And, you know, this is so easy to do in, in marriage and in relationships well, I remember when you did this, and then you did this too. Uh-huh, that's three against you, and I've only, you know. <laughs> that needs to, that mentality is of the world. That mentality is of the flesh. We need to drop that and say, God, what do you want me to do? And God would say, I want you to forgive, okay? The world and flesh goes, I'm not forgiven. I'm keeping score here. That's three times. <laughs> and God says, no, 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 no. The new man in you says, you forgive them even as God had forgiven us. Amen. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God he didn't say, well, nope, Danny's done sinned 12 times uh, in the last 30 minutes, so I can't forgive him anymore. No, <laughs> he doesn't keep score. And if he doesn't keep score on us, praise God, how we, you know, it just makes sense that we should want to help each other and forgive one another. All right. Stewarding life, stewarding friendship. God help us to, you know, make good friends and then be the type of friend that wants to encourage and help people. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this time looking at Ephesians, and we thank you for your word that gives good guidelines on not only uh, what kind of friends we should want, but really what kind of friend we should strive to be and make it evident in our life, Lord, that we love the truth, that we put away lying, but we want to encourage and have no corrupt communication, Lord, but help us to seek to uh, lift up people and encourage them uh, along the way. Thank you for this time. Now, please bless the remainder of the services today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.